what is everything set? Do I need to press anything? Uh, yeah, Gary set it up, so I should be okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. And uh, uh, welcome to our International Women's Day event organized by IDS, um, Countering Backlash, Reclaiming Gender Justice Program funded by CEDA and the ESRC funded research project, Sustaining Power, uh, Women's Struggles Against Contemporary Backlash in South Asia. I am Sohila Nazneen. I'm a fellow in the governance cluster. I'll be moderating this session. Uh, we have a panel of exciting speakers today, and um, we are hoping that you will get stimulated and excited by the discussion. Uh, so let me introduce you to our panel of speakers. Um, we have Mahin Sultan Mainapa, if you would, uh, um, if you are able to show us Yes, thank you. So Mahin Sultan is based at BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, based in Bangladesh. She's in a car, as you can see, she just, she's returning from the airport. So we are hoping her uh, her connection will stay. She's a senior fellow of practice there. Um, Amun, uh, Dr. Amun Ashaba is a researcher based at Center for Basic Research. She's all, He's also a faculty member at the University of Makerere. Um, we have, our very own Dr. Deepta Chopra, who's a fellow in the governance cluster. Wave your hand, Deepta. She also is the PI for the Sustaining Power Research Project. Um, we are hoping that Zara Khan, from, who's the General Secretary from Home-Based Workers uh, Foundation from Pakistan, will join us. Um, let's see. And uh, we have, Maria, if you would turn your camera on our very own postgraduate researcher, Maria Grados Bueno, who was also an MA gender student with us a few years back and who's uh, working on Peru. So that's our panel of speakers. We will have two rounds um, that the speakers will do their interjections. Um, and each speaker will have about four minutes to speak in each round. And after two rounds, we will open up uh, at the floor for Q&A. And the speakers know that I am quite a strict moderator. So once four minutes are up, uh, I will mute you or wave my hand or stare at you. Uh, so we will start with Amun. So we are going to Uganda. And um, Amun, my question to you is Uganda made a lot of advancements around gender equality. You guys have a very strong presence of women MPs in the parliament and very strong women leaders. But recently, Uganda is seeing uh, an undermining of these gains. And your team focused on the recent sexual offense bill and the discussions around that in the parliament. So could you tell us a little bit about how backlash manifested in the way things were debated in the parliament and what kind of opposition this um, bill faced? Amun? You're still muted, Amun. It seems frozen. Thank you so much, uh, Sohila. Um, and thank you for uh, availing us this opportunity to share a number of learnings from the research process. Census bill was uh, tabled in 2019, and it's, it was aiming at establishing a consolidated uh, law that would address widespread sexual violence uh, recorded in different societies in Uganda. Um, and so this bill was moved as a private member's bill by a, a woman member of parliament who also chaired uh, Uganda Women Parliamentary Association, a body that brings together women parliamentarians. Um, what did happen was that when this bill was ready for tabling, Usually all the bills require a certificate of financial implication before you table them for the first reading. And this is usually a certificate that is uh, issued by Ministry of Finance, basically to state that these are issues of national concern. They have an implication on the economy 
and that this bill can also be funded once it passes as a law. That certificate was denied. Um, they looked for it. The Minister of Finance postponed, sent them to other ministries and delayed immensely the tabling of the bill. So, uh, and, and finally, as we will see in terms of how women did that, they tabled the bill on extraordinary grounds. And those grounds are provided for under another law in Uganda, which is called Public Finance Management Act, which says that if a bill has been denied the certificate for 60 days, it will be deemed to have acquired the certificate. And that is what the you know, women members of parliament who are pushing for this navigated that denial of the certificate. The other forms of resistance uh, were experienced uh, during the discussion on one of the clauses on whether to give or withdraw consent to a sexual encounter before or during the sexual activity. Um, this provision springs from another existing law, the Domestic Violence Act. At that time, it was called marital rape. And so when it was resisted in the other, it was brought by you know, women actors here as granting consent in a way of trying to curtail experiences of, of forced sexual encounters, especially within marriage arrangement. This is one of the clauses of the bill that received the and because a member of parliament, particularly men, questioned how practical it was going to be, you know, to establish that somebody has withdrawn consent in the middle of the act. Um, the other question was also around, are we not legislating too much about the private matters of the bedroom? And this kind of resistance manifested in a very tricky manner. They characterized consent. Uh, I'm going to be lost you, but can you hear us, Amun? Amun, you're muted. You're muted, and we lost you. Um, I was talking about. So you were talking about the debates Hello? around consent. Yeah, we can hear you, Alman, now. Yes, I, I, I can hear you. Yes, so okay. we heard up till the debate on consent. Okay. Uh, let me wind up on that. The debate on consent was equated to a plan taking off. And members of parliament, particularly men, said, well, when you're taking off, uh, in a plan, consent is given on the takeoff stage. And once you are up in the air, you cannot disrupt that process. So that is the that generated a lot of laughter and humor and to the, to the effect that even the substantive discussion on... We lost you again, Amun. Can you hear us? Sexual abuse among us children, or how can you stop a man when he yes, I can. Okay, go ahead. Um, the last one I wanted to share how backlash manifested was around. I mean, do you just want to turn your video off and just talk to us? the introduction of uh, this, uh, the spread of HIV, and thirdly, uh, same-sex relations. So when this clove, they were you know, categorized by the opposition. We lost you again, do you just want to? As foreign, not have foundation within
Um, and do you just want to turn your video Africa. off? And so, um, Um, yes, we lost, yes. yes Sohila? we lost you for a little bit. Do you want to turn your video off so the streaming's better? Okay. Yes. Let, let, Go ahead. Okay. So I the, the third aspect where this bill experienced resistance uh, was around the introduction of clauses on sex work, criminalizing sex work, same-sex relations and sexual encounters that led to the spread of HIV. And the discussion was that um, sex work and same-sex relations were really provisions that are fallen and that were introduced by foreign forces. And so these were some of the contentious clauses upon which all the resistance about the bill was organized. Um, these forms of resistance and much more, we do document them in the working paper that we have published with the IDS on unraveling gender backlash in the context of sexual offenses bill. So I can stop here. Uh, hopefully we can add from that. Sure. Thank you, Amon, uh, despite the disruptions <laughs> for going forward with, with the discussions. And we can see that the backlash came in the le legislative process itself using different maneuvers, but also it was discursive in terms of how the bill was framed and issues around con consent that made debatable and, and the way sort of then the issue of sex work was brought in into the debate and then how you delegitimize the claims that are being made. So from Uganda and sort of talking about debates around legislative process, um, we move on to looking at what happens when you do manage to pass a law and then how does backlash manifest? So we are going to go to Bangladesh and look at the implementation and sort of the, how backlash manifests in that process of the Domestic Violence Prevention and Protection Act. So the law was passed in 2010. And then it has been very slow in terms of implementation. Uh, but Mahin is going to tell us more about this is not just because Bangladesh lacks capacity or it doesn't have enough resources. So what happens uh, with when you try to deal with implementing agencies? So Mahin, over to you. Thank you very much, Sohela. And thank you for inviting me to present at the seminar. So the research I'm presenting was done or is being done under the Countering Backlash Program. And I have to apologize for my colleague, Roka, who had a fam death in the family, which is why she couldn't join. So as um, Sohela was saying, we had a challenge in trying to understand how backlash manifests itself during the implementation process, because it's been better studied during the policy formulation process. So um, when this law was formulated, it was seen as a really landmark and a victory both for the women's movement and something very positive that the government had done. And this government really showcased its commitment to gender equality, to working on violence against women. And we have had rules that were formulated for the law and a policy against violence against women. But unfortunately, implementation has lagged behind. And there are a number of factors. And just to give you a bit of context, uh, the political scenario has changed. Uh, gender, uh, it's we moved from a multi-party system to a dominant party system. Uh, the priority for women's empowerment, uh, gender equality has is much less. The government is less worried about how it appears to women voters. Um, so our question that we were looking at is that the uh, lack of implementation, how much of it is due to lack of capacity or resources, or is it really an intentional backlash? And we found that, uh, in fact, there was some change. There are some weaknesses in the law itself because it was trying to be something very experimental and innovative. It was a quasi-civil law uh, or quasi-criminal law, if you wish, uh, which was trying to um, bring justice and relief to survivors of domestic violence by providing them protection, a right to residence, and various remedies which would not criminalize 
the man uh, for committing domestic violence, which would allow some sort of reconciliation. So um, what we saw, in fact, that the uh, while the implementation started, um, the different agencies were very, very reluctant to do this. Um, and this reluctance is also rooted in the, let's say, the social cultural norms around uh, what women can complain about, uh, their position in the family, what a family is supposed to be. And so we found these uh, attitudes and um, among the practitioners uh, and the legal um, practitioners and the government agencies supposed to implement the law uh, were justifying the inaction. And so their efforts and norms it would be able to understand the, the delays. So we could see denial, inaction, trivialization, stigmatization, delegitimization. So let me um, talk about a few of these. Um, in fact, uh, domestic violence was seen as a trivial matter. That is, it's not as important as more grievous hurt or more heavy, uh, important legal matters. Legal practitioners should not be bothered with uh, matters such as this. This should never come to court. Um, if uh, domestic violence occurs, it's the women's fault. They, they don't know how to take care of the family or it's the women in the family who are responsible for uh, creating unrest and conflict leading to domestic violence. Um, uh, this is uh, something illegitimate because this law was um, heavily backed by the NGO sector and the human rights practitioners. And um, uh, because right now we have a lot of tension between government and NGOs, so calling it an NGO law is a way of delegitimizing it to the government agencies. Um, so these are all different kinds of manifestations of the backlash. Oh, another way was to say that the women uh, were um, responsible for domestic violence because they themselves uh, are carrying on adultery. And so this is a way of coming out of the marriage. So stigmatizing the victims of domestic violence themselves. And we saw that the agencies such as the police and the Women's Affairs de Department uh, would say that um, not giving it any kind of priority uh, for Women's Affairs Department issues such as child marriage or you know, their um, social protection schemes are much more important. And uh, domestic violence is in the la last on the list of priorities. For the police, um, they were also delegitimizing any complaints that came in because the, in this law, the police doesn't have any kind of um, direct action. It's more a preventive action that they have to take. And for them, that doesn't match with their priorities or their concept of what the police so, should do. So whenever a claim would come, they would try to um, mediate it and send the woman home saying that go and solve the problem and don't bother us with this. So these were all the, the kinds of uh, backlash that we saw. Thank you so much, Mahin, for elaborating the different ways backlash manifests. So it's not just having a law on paper, it's those who implement the law, what they think, whether they prioritize it, how they look at the claims and whether they undermine those claims that uh, matter. Uh, so let's move on from Bangladesh to India. So I will ask Deepta to talk about, we looked at um, sort of framing of a law and how backlash manifests. We looked at how implement, what happens during implementation and uh, how that is undermined. What we are going to look at is what happens when your rights are rolled back. So we are looking at the Citizenship Act in India and uh, the protests in Shahinbagh particularly. So you all know that that was a Muslim women led protest. So basically I will ask Deepta to elaborate what did, what did this act mean in terms of backlash against a particular uh, minority group, but it's also about then what kind of backlash did the activists face? So Deepta, come here. Great, thank you very much, Sahala. And I think, um, I mean, the Shahinbagh case uh, was actually a, a rollback of basic citizenship uh, rights and uh, 
the main uh, the the main impetus for the for the for the for the movement to come come together was violence against students uh, uh, in 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 a particular university and uh, and that, that from there it rolled on. But really, uh, when I spoke to the women, it was it was about the the threat that this potential act posed to their and their children's future. Um, and uh, the backlash manifested itself in 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 very explicit but also insidious ways. Uh, and quite dangerous ways as well. Um, so one of the first things that uh, was said about uh, the movement was that, oh, you know, like this is this is a religious movement and therefore it's anti-national and Muslims are trying to take over, et cetera, et cetera, right? And and uh, and and this was this was um, this went hand in hand with the fact that the media, the mainstream media, uh, was really um, kind of portraying the the actual. Um, uh, sit in. It was a hundred day sit in, twenty four hours. The, the women blocked a main road in India, and that was one of the main things that they were criticized about. Is that oh, you know, they should like, they can they can do their protest, but can they not like you know disrupt normal life and you know so that people can get to and from work and because because the commuting times of of people who regularly use this had increased so much, um, uh, and uh, and there was also. At the site itself, there was a lot of surveillance by the police. The police set up facial recognition cameras. Um, and I'll tell you later about what the women did about those cameras. And that was really interesting. But but it was, it was you know, there was a lot of intim intimidation, um, you know, uh, from and also from the from from the government in power. And, you know, so these women are, are taking kind of like the government head on. Um, uh, mainly also because I mean, and uh, you know, like so, so they were they were also protesting because the Citizenship Act required everyone to produce papers that you know which which qualified the, them as as citizens of a country. And as you can imagine, in in countries like like India, uh, women's or girls' birth is barely recorded, let alone uh, you know when they get married, and then you know they're given new names, first name, surname, everything changes. There's no link to, you know, and and also, you know, uh, the large majority of the poor people, documents just don't exist. So that was that was this. But but I think what really turned um, the backlash into a dangerous terrain was when they were labeled as um, terrorists, and um, and 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 this was like both, uh, you know, like a fear mongering by the politicians. Um, and 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 this was followed by um, you know attack on uh, another university um, uh, in terms of the students there by right wing forces. Um, so a lot of uh, vilification, but also you know some some sorts of discourses about oh these women are there because they've taken a hundred rupees to sit or five hundred rupees to sit and they're here to eat biryani, right? So they they've just come because there's free food, and and that's you know and of course you know. Um, so, so that was the, the the thing that. But I think um, so. This was this was all during the protest site, and and you know, like, and and you can imagine that um, um, the the temperature of of the site got raised every time you know some um, some incident happened. So there was like, for example, a a man who 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 came on the outskirts of of the site and fired several gunshots into the air. And you know, and 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 said, oh, you know, like I'm going to like these these people are these people should be shot, um, and and this was unfortunately um, repeated by politicians on media saying that you know these are anti-national protesters and they should be they should be shot and you know um, killed basically, um, and and the final thing was that you know there was a very regressive procedure and unfortunately COVID happened. And this, um, you know, the law about COVID was used to, to actually dismantle the site. And within about two days of, um, you know, the 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 the, the COVID, um, what's it called? Lockdown, thank you. The lockdown, <laughs> the COVID lockdown happened. Uh, the site was demolished. There, there remains no trace of it. Everything, all billboards, all the artwork that the women had hung up, et cetera, was all painted over. It all looks like nothing happened ever. So, you know, just to erase the, even the memory of, of it, but quite viscerally. Um, and I just wanted to also say that, you know, although this was at the, you know, like all during 
during this kind of like 100 to 110 days period. What was really problematic and still remains problematic is that supporters of um, Shaheen Bagh, you know, young people who spoke at uh, the Shaheen Bagh rally, et cetera, were picked up months after the protests had done and, and put in jail. Uh, and some of them still remain in jail. Um, one of them uh, was freed after about a year. And she was an ex MA, MA student here from IDS. Um, and you know, like, and these are these are young people who are studying, who are kind of like you know, and, and their only, I suppose, fault. But they were they were booked under the draconian um, UAPA Act, which is like the anti-terrorist act with with no bail and things like that. And so. You know, it, it kind of carries on in, in very sort of dramatic and dangerous ways. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Deepa, for elaborating on the dangerous ways backlash man manifests, particularly sort of direct attacks and harassment of activists who dare to stand up and that it continues. It's not just episodic that during the time of protests, the state can track you for a long, long time if it decides to repress. Um, while we are waiting for Zara, um, she's online. Hi, Zara, welcome. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, I'll give you a few minutes Thanks. to gather yourself. So I'll ask Maria her question and then come back to you with yours. How's that? Uh, um, yes, it's okay. It's okay for me. Okay, yeah, we can hear you. Um, so Maria, I'll ask you your question now. So which is basically you are working in Peru on looking at labor rights, uh, particularly looking at the trans community. So there is no formal labor, labor law that protects the trans community and then attempts to introduce different types of measures for trans community faces backlash. So if you could tell us sort of what does the lack of a law means and also a little bit about the backlash. Uh, yes, perfect. Thank you, Suhela, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of the panel. Uh, and the moment I am a postgraduate researcher at IDS, so my research is about the access to the labor market of trans women in Peru, and I will be talking about the backlash and difficulties that trans women face in the economic sector, drawing from my experience uh, of doing the PhD. So this backlash can happen mainly in two ways, as a reactive response to gains made by gender justice movements, but also as a structural phenomenon, since in the case of Peru, there has been a very slow progress on gender justice in general. So first, it's a structural phenomenon, which is visible in the difficulties that trans women experience in their uh, access to the labor market, in their everyday experiences. Uh, in general, the LGTB population in Peru are among the least employable groups, However, within this group, trans women are particularly structurally constrained to precarious economic activities. Uh, in Peruvian capital, for instance, 64% uh, of trans women work as sex workers and 28 as hairdressers. And in contrast, only a very small percentage perform jobs in other sectors. Other studies have been carried out, particularly by civil society, and show a similar pattern in other regions and nationally. So this is a phenomenon that happens throughout the country. Uh, due to the fact that sex work is their main economic activity that places them at a higher risk of harassment and violence, but also increases trans people's risk of contracting HIV. Uh, in that sense, trans women are on one of the population more affected uh, by HIV in the country. And all of this contributes to the fact that the average life expectancy of trans people in Latin America is of 30 to 35 years, uh, which is around half of the life expectancy of the general population. So there are many reasons for uh, this uh, backlash or the difficulties they confront in these experiences. Among the main ones, there are prejudices and stereotypes from the Peruvian population. Uh, the prejudices against the trans population are framed under a narrative of pathology and danger. Uh, also, it is difficult for trans people to access the education system, which limits their situation in the labor market. In general, a very small percentage of trans women can complete university, and there is a very high percentage that do not finish high school. Uh, this mainly happens because uh, LGTB people are marginalized uh, in or even excluded from schools because of their sexuality or gender identity. 
increasing trans people's likelihood of being bullied or dropping out from school. So uh, despite this situation, there are almost no policies from the government uh, to protect the rights of trans people, except a specific policies that are linked to HIV and AIDS. Uh, two examples are key to understand this. There is a lack of a gender identity bill in the country. So there is no standard policy in relation to change uh, their name and sex in trans people's national identification documents, which means that trans people's rights to an identity are constantly violated. Uh, trans women report this as one of the key reasons for discrimination in the labor market. Uh, legislative process was project was presented in 2016, but due to backlash from conservative parties, uh, it has not still been discussed by Congress plenary. And also the Peruvian anti-discrimination law does not acknowledge a trans person's gender identity or sexual orientation as a cause for discrimination. And there are no specific laws for that provide support to the trans community. So all this context kind of shows uh, the backlash and difficulties that trans women face in Peru while accessing the labor market. Uh, I think in the second section, maybe I can talk more a bit more about the process of introducing the gender identity law in particular. Sure, thank you, Maria, that was spot on time. And you raised the issue about the everyday kind of structural violence that's connected to backlash, that what you experience every day. So it's not just about a particular bill or a particular law and what's happening. So thank you so much. So Zaira, we'll come to you with your question. So we are going back to South Asia again. We are going to Pakistan. So Zaira, you're part of the home-based workers movement. Um, could you tell us um, what kind of backlash? Um, there is a lack of legal framework to protect uh, home-based workers. So could you tell us a little bit about the impact of that and the kind of backlash? that you are facing. Okay, fine. Uh, thanks a lot to, uh, for inviting me in this very important discussion. Uh, so I think uh, the, our, our whole moment is basically based on 15 or 16 years of uh, our struggle. So I can't discuss each and everything, but uh, what we have faced from start till now, uh, the issue we have faced from the different people, I can discuss you uh, with you. Uh, there are there is overall decline of the labor movement in Pakistan. In such a situation, the involvement of home-based worker in the labor movement is an achievement in itself. So it was a unique experience for us, and we have and we succeed in uh, this ex uh, experiment. And other people are also following us. So this is the very uh, in inspiring thing for us that uh, the pe other people are uh, following us. So the first backlash was from uh, the workers themselves we have faced first. Uh, women themselves used to say that uh, we are not the worker and the contractor themselves come to their home and provide work. They get uh, work sitting at home and earn money. So they can manage household things and also earn money without going outside. But gradually they realized that these contractors actually were exploiting them. So, uh, and it's only because of the study circle and, and the constant uh, communication we had with the, these home-based workers. So first step was there that uh, we have to um, uh, make understand each and every woman that what the situation they are facing uh, by working. Sarah, we lost you for a bit. You're muted. Hello? Yes. Am I audible now? Okay. So the, the, so the second uh, backlash came to us was uh, uh, in the form of the women workers in, in, You're muted again, Sarah. Okay, her connection dropped. Um, so what we will do is we'll move on to the next round and we'll hope that Zara will join us in, in, in the meanwhile. Um, Shanana, do you have her contact? Can you just message her? That's what we are doing. So let's move on to round two. So speakers, you'll have to sort of do rapid fire rounds in this sense. 
So what we heard about the different mani ways backlash manifests. So Amun, we are coming back to Uganda again, and we are asking you basically that given the pushback that this uh, sexual offense bill faced, uh, what's happening now to counter this uh, pushbacks? What, what did the so women do? Um, thank you so much. Um, if I can pick from where I started, uh, the, the kind of procedural resistance to the bill uh, by denying it a certificate of financial implications was more negotiated by women parliamentarians making this an issue on the floor of parliament. They documented the number of times they, have, they had moved to parliament uh, to, to government agencies, particularly the Minister of Finance and Minister of Gender, you know, tabling letters written to ministers and, and how many times they have been told to come back again over no issue, and concluded that this was not uh, coincidental. This seemed to be a deliberate ploy to frustrate the law. And then they, you know, returned to the other Public Finance Management Act, to say if the ministry has denied us this uh, certificate, we will table this on extraordinary grounds. And the Speaker of Parliament then, who was um, uh, Right Honorable um, Rebecca Kadaga, who had been you know, also put into the fold of Alliance as uh, an incredible individual ally, uh, picked up and accepted the bill and uh, accepted the bill to be tabled. And she raised this same issue to say that it seems the certificate is being used as a way of resisting bills that promise to transform certain unequal gender relations. The other way was to, to uh, for the women actors to identify the opposition uh, to the bill and engaging them in, 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 in breakfast meetings, raising these issues and seeking for what could be adjusted in the bill to have it promoted within parliament. So you had a lot of uh, meetings between women's rights organization members and um, opposition members on breakfast meetings, trying to discuss how these, bill, uh, these clauses in, in the bill could be pushed. Uh, the other one, which was, I think, very interesting was, um, working with uh, Uganda Women Parliamentary Association as a platform, first of all, to mobilize who should sponsor the bill and who should promote the bill in different audiences. So uh, the, this platform brings together mem women members of parliament, but uh, this, this membership cuts across political parties. So they used this to mobilize for support within parliament among us male MPs, although they later had a complaint about uh, men whom they had recruited as allies to assist in the, in the passage of this bill, as well as building alliances outside parliament. For instance, um, WOPA is known to have deliberately held meetings with women umbrella organizations like uh, Uganda Women's Network to draw on their historical engagement on, on promoting of these bills to source for finances and to source for individuals who could push this agenda within the civil society. The other one was um, deliberately um, blacking out the media. Um, we do know that the media plays a central role in promoting bills of this nature, but given it, it's focus on sexuality and these issues of sex and sexual abuse. You know, members of parliament thought that if they discussed this bill in its prime stages outside the media, they would be able to push the bill to a certain level where they would be able to invite media houses to sell it to the audience. They argued that we have had cases in Uganda where bills have passed on the floor of parliament without necessarily having the media carry stories here and there. So if, if you trace the history of this bill, you will actually realize that there was limited reporting in the newspapers, 
um, except when the bill came on the floor of parliament for discussion. And of course, the other last one is um, the discussive framing that went on. Um, you know, women who are central to this process will tell you how they agreed that um, sex work should not be part of this bill, that uh, HIV should not be part of this bill, and that issues of same-sex relations, which had um, created tension in the area years in parliament, should not be part of this. Um, and later on also discussively, you know, reframing marital rape and calling it consent to avoid any possibilities of reincarnating the resistance that happened during the domestic violence bill. So you do realize that there was a lot, a lot of activity going on, which at times, um, if you look at the end product of the bill failing to pass, you may not realize how much energy, how much alliance building went into the process of promoting this particular bill. Thank you, Amun, for elaborating those very diverse strategies at different levels of different actors. Mahin, we'll go to you in terms of what is the Citizens Initiative for Against Domestic Violence doing now, given that implementation has faced resistance? Oh, thank you. Well, the Citizens Initiative uh, for domestic, Against Domestic Violence, CIDB in short, was formed um, when the bill was uh, drafted and it worked to have this bill uh, adopted and passed and approved. And since then it has continued working. It's an alliance of 32 organizations, women's organizations, as well as um, human rights organizations. And uh, it has uh, focused a lot on capacity building. It started off by doing training for government officials, uh, for lawyers, uh, the judiciary, for those who would have to deal with uh, uh, complaints coming in. Um, and it also helped draft the rules. So there was a lot of work around capacity building. And at that time, the government was quite open to working with civil society to build up this capacity to deal with these issues. Um, it has continued as a strong advocacy forum um, using uh, the media, using public events, uh, special days to highlight issues of uh, domestic violence and what the provisions are in the law, what is being done and what is not being done. So it continues as a very strong advocacy force to create this pressure on government for implementation. So working on the policy for uh, stopping violence against women. It was thought that that policy would improve um, implementation of this law as well. Um, it has worked as a accountability to establish accountability through yearly meetings with the Ministry of Law, the Ministry of uh, Women's Affairs, where uh, what has happened or has not happened is discussed, the problems are discussed, the frustrations faced by the uh, coalition are brought up and asking government to answer for what has happened and has not happened. One of the techniques was to file a right to information uh, petition to ask how many cases in fact have used this law and are under uh, you know, process. Uh, that took a very long time coming but it has worked as an accountability mechanism. Um, another very important uh, strategy was to generate evidence. And uh, since, since the law was passed, we know of at least five major studies which looked into what has been happening, what are the problems, what are people's attitudes, why things are not moving. And each time these studies came out, these were used to raise awareness, create pressure, also understand what adjustments needed to be made to the law or to the procedures. So this was done five years after the law was uh, enacted, 10 years after. And uh, during COVID, 
uh, a number of studies looked at whether COVID resulted in an increase in a number of cases. So that was also another strategy of using events such as the COVID-19 pandemic to bring additional um, attention to this issue. Because uh, worldwide, there was a fear that the number of uh, cases of domestic violence would increase. And so the demand for online mediation for online GDs, et cetera, was raised. But unfortunately, that was only applied to other cases and not domestic violence. Um, another very important strategy is that of building alliances at both national and local level. And we've seen that this alliance building, at least in, in individual cases, results in some women getting access to justice. Because working with allies, one can, uh, at least on a individual cases make an, the difference. But another, finally, I'd like to mention the most important strategy is of changing gender norms. So that has been done through the media, but uh, the coalition looks on the law itself as a means of changing people's attitudes and understanding of what domestic violence is, that it's also a violation of rights, that women have the right to justice, that they have the right to protection, uh, that they have a right to their own homes. So th this is a very long-term strategy because we've seen in the 10 years, okay, there's a better understanding of what domestic violence is, but not a full commitment to stopping uh, domestic violence. But using the law as a tool for, let's say, cultural and social change is a very important strategy. Thank you, Mahin, for that detailed um, kind of discussion on the different strategies, but also drawing attention to um, norm change, but the way the coalition has sustained pressure, including using government's own accountability mechanism to generate evidence as to what is going on. Uh, Deepa, do you want to come here and talk? tell us about things were dismantled and there was a lot of backlash, including direct back, uh, attack on the activists? So what's happening now to counter? Well, uh, before I go to what's happening now, I think what I should do is take you to Shaheen Bagh, which is a space of joy and love and celebration. And, you know, uh, and, and that was that was one of the, the key things that the women brought to to the to to the space was this uh, sort of kind of like having a diverse but also diffuse leadership where you know, women went up to these surveillance cameras and said, I am so-and-so, et cetera, et cetera. And they actually, you know, like, and there were thousands of them, right? So it wasn't it wasn't an easy kind of like, oh, you know, we're going to target this person because this person's the leader, right? And I also wanted to think about uh, what both uh, Mahi Napa and, and Aman said about building coalitions. And that was another very important strategy of like building coalitions, but at the same time remaining independent and autonomous. So there wasn't kind of like, oh, there's a particular organization that is now going to, you know, like run this, this struggle or whatever. So this, this diffuse leadership was really an interesting um, idea that, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is different to what um, usually women's struggles have seen uh, in South Asia, at least. Um, and 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 the, the 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 second one was really using secular symbols. So they were, they were labeled anti-national. They talked about the Citizenship uh, Act. They talked about the Constitution. They 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 put up artwork, which was another form of you know using art as resistance. And they put up all these you know they 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 talked about the Constitution. They did not talk about being Muslim. They didn't talk. They didn't. They talked about being citizens and demanding that accountability and that that recognition from the Indian government that they were citizens. And that was um, that was a really important idea of like reappropriating, you know, these civic idioms that that were used initially to, you know, appropriate it as, you know, this is what means to be national. They actually went and said, actually, no, this is what mean, means to be national. So they redefined the terms. And again, you know, like the norms around that. Um, and I think there was a lot of everyday conversation uh, that happened at the site, uh, around the site. Every household was talking about Shaheen Bagh, what was going on, uh, et cetera. And, 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 and so this, this whole notion of women being 
good mothers and good wives and therefore need to stay in this whole patriarchal and religious kind of like um, um, way of, of looking at women was really countered through everyday conversations. And, and, and I think the, the final one um, was about, the strategy was about building a rotational shared space. As I said, this was a space of joy. It was, it was there for 24 hours. Everybody was welcome. Everybody was offered biryani when they went. Um, you know, um, they invited the prime minister uh, to tea. They 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 made jokes about um, you know uh, saying that oh you know like I can name seven generations of my grandfathers. Can the prime minister do that? You know, and they 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 really kind of like um, had this kind of joy, but also an ethos of care, which they showed, um, which was which was then. I think copied into and and has successfully been deployed by other struggles like the farmer struggle. So when I meant an ethos of care, it was it was about kind of creating, as I said, a shared space, a space of solidarity, uh, a space where uh, there was a children's tent where children used to you, you know you could you could leave your children. There was a rotational kind of like childcare system going on where children are always running around in the site, et cetera. Um, there was um, kind of like a, a reading tent, which was really important to, for, for these everyday conversations, et cetera. And, 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 and again, reaching out to students that were attacked, reaching out to uh, people who were, who were vilified and standing up against them was really important. Yes, the site was closed. They did go online for a bit. Um, but with the continued repression, it's become nearly impossible for anyone to 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 raise their um, their head. And and as I said, you know, this diffuse leadership works because there's no face to the movement. But in social media terms, then that you know it becomes slightly difficult. And because they were not organized, um, they they've not been able to sustain the the the, the pressure uh, on the government. However, having said that, you know, I think the government will, the government will think about 100 times before actually implementing the CAA again. So I think that was that that was really um, something which was important. And, and the last thing I'd say is that none of these strategies were priorly thought about. These grew organically in response to the backlash. So thank you. So, that was right in time. <laughs> Thank you, Deepta, for talking about diffuse leadership that reduces the risk, particularly in repressive contexts. That is an important strategy. Uh, but at the same time, um, what do you do with social media when it can't be done that way? And that is a platform a lot of activists use to uh, raise voice when it's not possible to gather physically. Uh, so that's a question for audience to ponder on. And those of you who are online, you can write your questions in the chat box and we will be picking that up. Um, so last but not the least, Maria, we are going to you to ask uh, what has been happening to claim rights for trans women in Peru. Uh, thank you. Uh, to think about collective efforts uh, to claim rights. I think it's important to understand the emergence of trans community-based organizations in Peru. Uh, in general, the first LGTB organizations were founded in the 1980s, but they did not represent the trans population or their needs. It's until much later in the early 2000s that trans community organizations started being formalized. And they questioned previous organizations by not making visible the violence and discrimination that they face due to their gender identity. And it's since then that these organizations have had a central role in countering backlash against trans people by making alliances with other organizations and political actors, as well as promoting different projects linked to the access to health, empowerment of trans activists, anti-discrimination initiatives, among others. And considering these diverse actions, I will just talk about two specific ones. Uh, first, trans community organizations have been making visible the specific problematic of their community by helping to produce information. Uh, since 2005, several reports about the situation of human rights of LGTB peoples in Peru have been produced, which included the participation of trans community-based organizations, civil society, and also articulated efforts with international institutions. It is very difficult to create information about this topic, 
as there is a lack of official data from the government. However, these reports have been key to identify cases where LGTB people's rights are being violated, allows to propose actions to improve the situation and make evident also how the Peruvian state has not developed initiatives to resolve the situation of vulnerability of trans people. Um, well, second, trans community organizations have carried out initiatives to produce changes at a political sphere. One of the most important topics on agenda, which is linked to the labor market access, is the promotion of a gender identity bill in the country. Uh, this bill will allow for trans people to change their sex and name in their IDs through an administrative process. Uh, nowadays, trans people must go before the judiciary to change their name and gender in their IDs, where demands are mostly rejected by judges due to discrimination. So in 2016, to counter this, a group of trans activists presented a draft of a gender identity bill to Congress with the support of Congresswomen from a left-wing Peruvian political party. So in Peru, first, a bill needs to be approved in the commissions where it's presented by a majority of Congress representatives. Afterwards, the bill goes to plenary of Congress to be enacted as a law. So the gender identity bill was presented to two commissions of Congress, uh, Constitutional Regulations and Women and Family. Uh, if the project was accepted by both uh, commissions, it would be discussed in Congress plenary. However, due to backlash from conservative opposition, the bill was not discussed until 2021 on the Commission of Women and Family. There were several activities of advocacy during these years from uh, the trans community, such as public presentations, articles in newspapers, reports on the needs of, for a gender identity bill, and holding meetings with the representative of different political parties to raise awareness about the importance of a gender identity law, and particularly meetings with members of uh, the Women and Family Commissions were very important, as this commission held a debate about the bill in 2021 and gave its approval to the bill to be discussed on Congress plenary. However, uh, the debate and opinion of the other commission uh, is still pending, and the legislation hasn't been discussed in Congress until now. So these are uh, a couple of examples of how the trans community organizations are carrying out actions around specific topics uh, uh, to improve the situation of rights of trans people in Peru. Thank you, Maria. That's uh, like uh, under time, and that's great, <laughs> you know. And uh, thanks for detailing what's happening both in terms of the legislative um, actions, but also uh, sort of the different ways the community generates evidence to show and use that to claim rights. Um, so we will open up the floor now for questions and answers. So I know James and Deepa are keeping an eye on what's happening online. Uh, Say there's yeah. an apology. She's actually at the march and is trying to connect from the march. Oh, he is clearly not working, which could be a coincidence or whatever it is. <laughs> well, that is probably state control over phones, but uh, I hope you send her the sort of solidarity from our end, and we will miss hearing her, but then we will have future occasions to hear her. Uh, so the floor is open to the audience for if you have questions and. Uh, Anyone? Yes, in the front. So, Yerker, then Vivanik. Okay, so I thought I might as well kick off since I didn't see any other hands. So, I'm Yerker Edstrom, the convener of uh, one of the programs here, uh, the Countering Backlash, uh, Reclaiming Gender Justice. Uh, and first of all, thanks for organizing this on the International Women's Day and uh, very apt and, and uh, appropriate examples and stories and, and inspirational um, stories and, and evidence. I, I have a question to all the presenters, or, or at least invite you to reflect on, um, because all of, I mean, in, in a sense, it feels like the problem of backlash here is framed in terms of um, legal rollback or, or pushback on, on various legal issues that affect women in particular. Uh, and that's uh, understandable, it's appropriate <laughs> particularly today. Um, but of course, uh, my, a lot more seems to be at stake. So a lot of issues come into it. So whether it's trans uh, rights issues in Peru uh, or 
uh, ethnic or religious identity issues in India, for example, uh, and, and so on. It's often said that backlash is about much more than gender. Um, and I'm sure that you're experiencing that in your countries too. Uh, but what strikes me is the resonance uh, between the examples across the different countries in South Asia, three different countries in South Asia, uh, in, in Uganda and in Peru, and we could list many, 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 many more countries there. So we're looking at a trend, uh, a, a global trend, um, in my view. Uh, so I'm wondering from your perspectives in country, um, how, what do you feel uh, or believe is driving this? Why? <laughs> Why is this happening? Uh, in what way is it part of something bigger? And what are the implications, what might the implications of that be for your, uh, for women's rights organizing at any level? Um, but you don't have to answer all those questions, but the main one is sort of why, what is driving this? Um, I have my own thesis, but I'm not gonna bore you with it here, but uh, happy to come back on that. Sure, um, shall we take the next question also, and then we can go to the panel. Thanks, Yoko. Uh, I think uh, I just have a couple of questions. So, so uh, it's related to, uh, it's more about the how to counter the backlash per se, right? So there are two things. Which I, so first is, uh, in any of the projects, are you working on any of the context? Uh, are you, and, prob and probably the strategy may not resonate with all, I realize, but uh, it's like an unpopular strategy where you engage with the opposite side, right? So for instance, uh, like as something as as something personal which I do. So I follow uh, a, a few so-called men's rights activists on Twitter, just to see that what are their arguments and right? what do they like? How do they position the issue against feminism and uh, primarily feminist law and jurisprudence? And then trying to understand that what is the uh, what are what are where are they coming from and what is and that probably allows me to. Uh, because I, I engage a lot on Twitter, then that allows me to frame my arguments and discussions from that lens. So do you think that, uh, so the first question is, do you think that uh, engaging with organizations which are opposing you, such as right-wing organizations or men's rights groups, do you think that makes sense? That is one. Uh, the second uh, point was about, uh, because, and of course, these are two ways, uh, these, uh, all the, both the projects are very uh, gendered issues. And as, a, but as a kind of Yerka said that the backlash is more about gender, right? So, so this is a like a question come suggestion is that when we are framing a counter to a backlash right do you think that the framing could uh, the framing could draw upon other uh, disciplines or other approaches just to give an example of what i mean so uh, as you know like there was a point i mean it's still happening but there was a point in time in india where a lot of muslim men were lynched based on the suspicion that they were carrying beef right now everybody the dominant narrative framed it as a hindu muslim issue right but uh, this person, a uh, scholar called Hilal Ahmed, he works on uh, Muslim issues and the Muslim identity. He says that rather than portraying it as a Hindu Muslim issue, which you will, which will get you to nowhere, why don't you put it as a law and order issue, right? Frame it as a law, question the state, state government on that law and order, that why are two random men, uh, sorry, why are five to six random men beating or killing or other the person who is none of their business, right? Of course, it's, it's just, uh, the hate and the killing is uh, driven by religious uh, considerations, but in a in a in a situation like india where there is uh, where there is so much uh, religiosity and so much theocracy in the in the politics so he says that you need to uh, play smart and use a different framing to highlight the issue so the second question is about that do you think that we need to maybe in some cases to speed in up the progress or to uh, i mean speed in up the progress in terms of counting the backlash do you, do you think we need to change our framings or draw upon these different uh, frames to address the issue yeah that's about it Okay, I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative and divvy up the questions. So, Amin, I would like you to talk about the the issue that was raised by Devanik on engaging men, because I know in countering backlash, we had looked at the oppositional actors, and you have talked to the oppositional actors, and you work on masculinities in Uganda. So you will be able to reflect on whether and how engaging men works or not, who are opposing the issue. And you did mention sort of uh, the parliamentarians talking to uh, people who were opposing the bill in parliament, but opposing the bill in parliament is one thing and opposing it public, publicly in public discourse and framing it in another way and whether you can change their minds is another thing. So uh, I would ask you to reflect on that. 
Um, and uh, Deepta, if you could talk about alternate framings, because the activists did use alternate frames in terms of drawing on the constitution and citizenship and et cetera. So Amuni first, then Deepta, and then Mahina Pab, uh, Yerker's question in terms of what is driving backlash, but then what does it mean in terms of women's uh, rights organizations organizing and the space there, because you did talk about the larger political scenario changing and us becoming a more of a dominant party state. So if you could touch on actually what are the other, other factors. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to point to Yerka that each of the presentations actually talk about norms and other aspects. It's not just about policy shift. Policies are connected to other aspects. Uh, so I'm on you first in terms of engaging men, particularly who are opposing. Thank you uh, so much. Um, I'm, I'm excited by the you know questions that are coming from the audience, um, particularly on whether engaging uh, uh, opponents makes sense. Um, well, I, I do think engaging opponents uh, does make sense because um, in some ways it is a, a creative way of crossing the polarities the borders, if we want to look at them in that sense. Uh, because of much of the uh, gender debates in Uganda, and I believe in other countries, in some other countries, it, it has been pitched in a way of, you know, polarizing uh, men and women in ways that, that have not um, opened up and created opportunities to understand men's interests, men's identities, but also to dig up, you know, social norms that define who a man is and what they can do in that sense, what they can, you know, accept uh, to, to do or to be part of. So engaging, um, engaging men in the Ugandan context has um, emerged from that context of overwhelming male opposition, to gender equity initiatives. Um, and the engagement is in a way of saying, okay, can they be part of this conversation um, so that they do not observe from the, the other side of the fence and generating resistance to this? Can they be part of this conversation? Um, can we understand what their concerns are, what the threat is? And, and of course, of course, as we, we've moved into this, we have realized that uh, these kind of conversations with men who oppose create a certain level of opportunity for men to raise questions in terms of how they have not been part of this discussion or how some of the concerns that define who they are have not been part of the discussion on gender. So there's that opportunity for consciousness rising to enable, for instance, men to realize that there are alternative ways of being a man, that you can actually be a man without being violent, without uh, you know, engaging in domestic violence. So in a way, it opens up space for conversation, enables learning and unlearning, and creates opportunities for alternative ways of men's expectations. How do you be? How do you become a man beyond what the cultural norm specifies? So I I, I think um, that's that's the opportunity that comes with engaging the opponent, but also you know engaging men in this particular sense. Um, thank you, Amin, for detailing that, uh, Deepa. Okay, so I did. I talked about the constitution and uh, you know how these civic idioms are really used by by these women to 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 reclaim the fact that they were citizens and valid and legitimate citizens of the Indian state. And I think that was one of the framings that they chose to use and and chose to engage with because they were hearing that that was you know being used against them. So the the use of the constitution. And the readings of the constitution and the explanations and the everyday conversations of the constitutions, something that's never happened before, right? The constitution is an idealized book that sits into in policymaking circles. 
women brought that out into, you know, uh, an everyday space of every, you know, as I said, you know, like, uh, you know, my parents didn't go. I went several times. So I was doing research there. But my parents never went to um, the, 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 the struggle itself. But the, the, the conversations that they were having about the, you know, that we were having suddenly of the about the Constitution were things that we'd never talked about before. Right. So I think they, they opened that space up. I think the other thing is about um, the framing is the framing of care, right? And the framing of care as a strategy of solidarity, the essential strategy that, that the essential glue that held this movement together and that would hold other movements together. Because care is considered to be, oh, it's a, it's, you know, it's it's women's work, it's it's in the private sector. I hope it happens within the household, right? And they brought that out. They brought brought not only their caring responsibilities out into the open, you know, as I said, with children running around in a children's corner and a reading center, et cetera, but also in their practice of reaching out to the opponents, uh, to the to the opposition leaders and inviting them for tea, inviting them for samosas, inviting them for biryani. I mean, it was it was this kind of like this ethos of care. And then that that same care that they then showed also to build so, you know coalitions and solidarities and i think that was a new framing that that feminist movements have not seen before so i think those were the two new framings i would say that happened okay mainapa uh the question for you is given that there there are other drivers of backlash it's not just always about women's rights and gender uh, what are the other drivers and what how are women's rights organization kind of organizing? Oh, well, before coming to that, I'd just like to add that what we saw is that um, while the law was being formulated, the more conservative, let's say, gender norms didn't become so apparent. It was more at an international CEDO, human rights treaties, et cetera, what is right rights violations. But when it comes down to the individual level, family level, and you are saying, and you are seeing a woman uh, protesting against violence against her husband and daring to challenge that, then it then the the more conservative norms do come out. And so I think at an implementation level, there's a different kind of reaction uh, than at the policy level which is also maybe when, since we have now so many progressive policies and laws, when we're now talking about the implementation, this is also maybe the moment when the people realize the implications and then start reacting. So that might be one part of the equation. The other is the political context we are in, um, where women's organizations, human rights organizations don't have a very strong voice. They don't count for much. Um, this is very different from the situation 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where the political parties, the bureaucracy was willing to listen, give us a seat at the table. But now it's become uh, so polarized. Um, NGO is a bad word. And uh, uh, women's organizations, uh, uh, the issues are seen as irrelevant. And um, I think with the increasing the economic uh, crisis. Um, these are now seen as now secondary issues. It's more important. How are we going to provide electricity for the people? How are we going to provide enough rice? Do we have enough foreign currency to um, run the generators? So it's, we are not being given any space um, because of this, both the political an economic context. And I think it's not just the Bangladesh level. I think this is an international trend. Thank you, Mayapa, for highlighting uh, what the economic crisis is triggering that every, every country in the world is feeling more or less, but also political contextual shifts matter in terms of do you count as a constituency and who the political elites are closer to and what kind of interests that they would pick up. Um, so uh, we have questions that were posed online. So um, the first one is about the link between growing backlash and growing authoritarianism. I think that applies to at least Uganda, Bangladesh, 
and India. So we will, um, um, I mean, mind if I'm not asking you to respond to this because there's a specific question for you, so we'll come to that. So I'll ask um, Amun uh, to respond to the link between growing backlash and sort of the lack of political space maybe or shrinking of space in Uganda. And then we can go to Deepa. And after that, then Mahinapa, I'll ask you the specific question that's for you. Amun? Yes, um, thank you. I, I think they, there is a link between the two, uh, growing backlash and, and growing levels of authoritarianism. Because um, you know, authoritarianism comes with um, you know that uh, you know lack of being attentive to the needs of the citizens. Uh, I do want to look at processes that we've had in Uganda, for instance, uh, that have to do with the change of the constitution uh, to remove certain. Uh, progressive democratic provisions like um, uh, term limits, how many years uh, a presidential candidate or a president must rule. When you remove such democratic principles, along the erosion of these also go the general principles that underpin gender equality. So you, you cannot lose progressive democratic principles in a constitution and hope to uh, remain with gender equity provisions. Um, and of course, the intolerance of citizen claims, including claims of gender equity provisions. Uh, what we have had, for instance, in a very recent last general election, was the suspicion that the increasing level of civil society engagement in raising their awareness to go and vote was perceived as a move towards opposing the sitting government. And that meant that women's rights organizations, which had nurtured space to connect to different social constituencies, had their uh, bank accounts frozen uh, because their activities, which we are raising the consciousness, the civic competences of citizens to go and vote, were seen as going against the, the sitting government, which was uh, seeking for a re-election. So, and, and because the funds were frozen, all the other activities that went beyond uh, gender and governance were affected. And, and, and the freezing of the funds was under the banner of these um, financial terrorists. And such kind of naming is, is strong and it has implications going forward. Um, it has implications in terms of uh, the funders that you can get in touch with or the audiences that you can mobilize and, and have a you know, to, to promote your gender equity agenda. So you can see that increasing authoritarianism does erode key principles that would be the foundation upon which to argue for gender equality. And once those are gone, then you're going to have increasing forms of resistance to gender equity agenda. Thank you, Amon, for making that point so strongly that what does, uh, what kind of danger authoritarianism poses for gender equality and, and women's rights. Deepta. Thank you. Um, India is not authoritarian, is it? Or is it? Um, well, um, so, so I think, I mean, uh, one of the things that, and Amon's right in making that link to kind of like, you know, gender equality, especially when authoritarianism usually comes with immense kind of like a, a form of patriarchal domination, you know, the, the 56 in chest, the masculinity that is, that is quite, um, you know, um, pervasive and, you know, is, is very, you know, is disturbed. Women should be good mothers and good wives. And that basically means they should stay inside the household and not definitely outside the household. So there is, you know, so authoritarianism combined with a patriarchal, mindset is what gives 
authoritarianism that 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 push to kind of like have to 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 consider anything that is said against it especially in the, if it's said by women or it's said for gender equality as kind of like a big threat right and that's where the backlash comes i think the other thing that authoritarian authoritarianism does is to give tools so the police the laws uh, the media the control of the media and the control of of the, of the growing kind of like you know um what should i say um resistance to ideas is or or certain norms are are spread by media and and are re kind of like strengthened by by media so you know like the the people only get what they're shown and so i think that in that way you know so by restricting civic space and the you know and 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 the indian government's doing this very effectively right they they've picked up only a few activists they've um returned only one or two researchers back from from the borders that's enough to create kind of like that sort of kind of like high alert going like we can't actually work in this space so that i think that's what growing authoritarianism does it's it's the fear and and sort of the the fear that you have no recourse because state has absolute power so what do you do um mainapa i'm coming to you with the question which was posed in the uh, online which is about what's the difference between backlash and stigma is stigma a part of backlash because you talked about st- uh, stigmatizing the victims and and uh, survivors of violence and their claims i mean obviously one can look at stigma separately from backlash but what we found that the women who were um complaining or protesting against uh, domestic violence were looked upon uh in a very negative way that they couldn't solve their own problems that uh they were unhappy in their marriages that there was something wrong with them uh that they were disobedient etc that was one part of it another is that the family the husbands felt uh that their honor was uh put into question if the wife was um brought it up brought up the problems in public and especially if the wife wanted to go to court so in a in the domestic violence act it's not a civil case or even a criminal case it's a petition but even making a petition for protection was seen as something that is dishonoring the man so there's a stigma attached to going to court uh talking about domestic violence in public so this seemed to be to us to be part of the wider backlash against um looking at uh domestic violence as a human rights issue um so obviously there there can be stigma attached to various other things but in this case it seemed to be one of the manifestations of backlash thank you vainapa uh very i'm going to come to you for the final question so my question is basically how do you think the legal fight will go uh do you think there is a chance of winning uh well at the moment in peru there's a very complicated to say the least uh political uh scenario uh so it is not exactly a pri- it's not a priority at the moment there is support from left wing uh uh representatives uh who have said that they will pick up on the law uh but also there's a priority in regards of what's going to happen in the broader uh political scenario so i think that this is a process that is going to continue and there is still advocacy from trans community organizations and civil society also uh but that due to this scenario it will take more time than the what has happened yeah we will keep our fingers crossed maria any burning questions from the floor or online no. you already asked a question devanik <laughs> anybody else Yes, Devanik, and very short. Very short. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, just a slightly an academic question. 
so this refers to the contradictions in the backlash politics where, uh, I mean, uh, which Yerka mentioned recently in his, uh, there was a brief around backlash. So for instance, uh, we talk about intersectional lines of intersectionality, but how do you academically and theoretically deal with the fact that let's say, uh, for instance, when I talked about men's rights groups in India, right? You'd be surprised to know that they're dominantly led by women and not men, right? Similarly, uh, in other contexts, uh, such as uh, in Brazil, where poor black women are supporting Bolsonaro or Trump. So this really, and personally for me, when I read this uh, instance and read these case studies, it personally, uh, like I struggle to uh, kind of accommodate with the fact because the theories and the uh, academic readings which we have done and we have engaged with kind of, it, it kind of challenges those. So how do we grapple with those challenges in, not in terms of practical terms, but in terms of theory, uh, like in theoretical terms? Yeah, that's Theoretically, you mean uh, how we think about intersectionality or are, are we thinking about masculinity? That would be opening up, uh, we'll need uh, like more than two hours. So I don't think it would be fair to any of the panelists to put them on the spot when we have two minutes left. So, so you pose the question, people have heard the question, let people ponder on it and we'll, we will basically close on that. Uh, we know that intersectional challenges are there. It's not easy to build intersectional alliances because you need to have differentiated solidarity. And it's not easy to build differentiated solidarity because you will have to then acknowledge that other groups have different interests than what you have. And then how do you accommodate that? That is a very contentious political question. But people have built intersectional alliances. It's not that it hasn't been done before, but the effort requires a different kind of approach, approach that builds on solidarity. Yes, Tita. I just to wanted to respond to that from actually Zera's point of view, because I've, I've come back from uh, a really great one week workshop where this issue really came up. And because the Home-Based Women's Federation positions themselves not as a feminist movement, but as a women's struggle. Right. But today, for example, Zara is at the Orat March, which is strongly, you know, the, the whole the whole Orat March secretariat and the organization says that they are a feminist movement. Right. So so there, there you know, so there are like in practice, there are being like alliances being being built. And I, I don't think that I don't think that backlash politics or the theory of, of how understanding backlash or why backlash actually precludes intersectionality. In fact, you know, it, it incorporates it very centrally because of the whole idea of alliance building and how do you build alliances? We don't take intersectionality into account. And so there is there is a very strong acknowledgement, I think, in, in the theory. So I, I'm not sure, we can talk later, but I don't think there's a contradiction in those two things. And I mean, each of the presenters talked about alliance building. You couldn't have built those alliances without taking intersectionality into account. But obviously, there's a lot of contention around that in terms of how do you do it. Um, OK, so this brings us to a close because it's exactly 1.30. So I wanted to thank my brilliant panelists for presenting their work. I also thank you all participants for coming here, asking these brilliant questions. Um, I mean, um, both Ben and Leah have been posting in the chat box the link um, to the different sites and publications. I thank the audience that has been online and has joined us today on International Women's Day. And thank you to Ideas Comms, um, Ben and Leah from Super Encountering Backlash Project um, for supporting us. Um, Yerker? Yeah, and can I just uh, thank you, Sohela, for your brilliant um, uh, sharing of the session. It's been brilliant, and thank you very much. Well, thank you all so much. So happy International Women's Day again. In solidarity, we are closing this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.